Hello. Hello. It's me. me. Echo and John. Hey, there, there there goes the echo. Hi, it's me. I'm John Park, and this is John Park's workshop. My audio uh, always freaks me out right at the beginning of the show. It's like seven echoes. Uh, so here we are. Thank you for coming today to John Park's workshop. Uh, you, you know what? Before I forget, even though we're here, right here, John Park's workshop, I want to talk about something that's happening next week. And that is that. That is what's going on next Wednesday. That's right, Wednesday, 10 10, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'll be doing a takeover, a special Ask an Engineer unboxing takeover. That's right, we're going to. Unbox Adabox 9, Adabox 009. Uh, hopefully, if you are a subscriber, you will have it in your hot hands by then. I know some people have been getting them already. Uh, I think they're almost all, if not all, shipped. Excuse me, which is very cool. It's 4,000 boxes. We had 4,000 subscribers, I believe. I'm looking in the chat over on YouTube. It looks like John Schaffstyle's Ada Box is arriving today, waiting anxiously. That's very cool. So, you know, when you get it, tear it open and dive in if you like. If you prefer to unbox it along with me and take a look at all the goodies, we'll be doing that at 8 o'clock next Wednesday during the usual Ask an Engineer slot. And guess what? Lady Ada and Mr. Lady Ada will be in the chat, hanging out, chatting along. Uh, as we do the unboxing, so it's going to be a fun time. I, uh, I want you to come and check it out, right? Uh, we've also got a humongous guide up for Adabox 9 that's already in the Learn system, so if you, if you can't wait, if you can't stand the suspense and you want to dive in and start doing things with your Adabox, check out the Learn Guide. It's an Adabox 009 main guide. It has uh, all kinds of info about what's in the box, how to use the parts that are in the box, and a whole bunch of projects using the very cool Halloween-themed Databox 009. So tune in next Wednesday, that's 1010, at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for the Ask an Engineer Databox 9 Unboxing Takeover Edition. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But right here, coming back to the now, the present, look what we've got. We've got a coupon code. The coupon code today is Harryhausen. That coupon code will get you 10% off in the Adafruit store. So head on over to Adafruit.com and check out lots and lots and lots and lots of cool stuff that you can buy and get 10% off in your shopping cart using that code. And that applies to everything in the store except for gift certificates, subscriptions, and software. So Harryhausen... Uh, that's a bit of a segue. It's, no, it's not, because I'm not going to do it right now, but it's a, it's a future segue. I don't know what the word is for that. It's a tease. Tease. Harryhausen, Ray Harryhausen. Uh, as you may know, most people, I think, are familiar with the name Ray Harryhausen. He is one of the greats of all time in stop-motion animation. Did lots and lots of uh, great creature animation, starting with Mighty Joe Young under Willis O'Brien. Uh, the guy who did King Kong, and then all the way through to, I don't know what the last stuff Ray worked on was actually, but you may know him from Clash of the Titans. It's a really famous one. Uh, so Harryhausen, that's going to get you 10% off in the store today. So check it out. Hey, I said store, so that brings us to the product of the week. The product of the week this week is the Cricut for Microbit. Uh, I have one right here I'm going to show. I, I did a little demo last night. I'm going to do the demo again to show you because I'm so excited about this Cricut for Microbit. Uh, I had not really used the Microbit much uh, when it came out. I think it came out right around, or we got them in the store, Adafruit store, right around the time that uh, Circuit Playground Express, I think, came out. And so Make Code, which I believe was originally written for using with Microbit, was being ported over to the Circuit Playground Express, and so I started using that right away. Uh, so I kind of missed out on the Microbit. So Microbit is awesome, and even awesomer is a Microbit inside of this little silicone uh, case, which makes it look like an angry, angry cat. Uh, so I'm going to plug this one in to a two AAA battery pack, and uh, you can see I've got a little animation, or a little uh, bitmap, rather, a little icon, 
uh, of a heart on there, and I've got these two buttons. And now over here, I have, I've actually configured this slightly differently from yesterday. So this is, this is uh, oh, let me turn it on. So this is the micro bit in the Cricut. So it's a special Cricut designed just for micro bit. It slots in there with its little edge connector. Uh, I've also got a cute little cat uh, sleeve on there for this one. And now what I'm going to do is use the very cool, get this arranged properly, very cool uh, Bluetooth connection that you can make between these just in make code. So just dragging blocks around. There's no wires connecting these. Uh, I can press the button on this one and it's going to spin the motor that I've attached here to the Cricut. And I'll press this one to stop that. Uh, so yeah, make code supports Microbit and Cricut. Uh, there is a special URL to do that, in fact, because it's uh, the, the instructions are on Learn Guide, so maybe we'll put the, the uh, link in later when I have a chance. But if I look at, I believe it's uh, makecode.microbit.org slash beta, and that's part one of it. Part two of it is you'll need the URL for adding the extension or the package um, for the Cricut, which is in a learn guide that I think maybe Mike Barella wrote. So if you look up just the main Cricut learn guide, uh, you will find the make code instructions for that. Uh, I think that, that that will become easier soon as it comes out of beta. Uh, that just becomes a, an easier to add extension. But yeah, so just a Bluetooth connection between these two. And when this sends the A button, uh, this will spin the motor. When it sends the B button, it'll stop. So and I'm using this cool little geared pager motor that we have in the store. And uh, today's show is just like a nesting doll of segues because this is a segue or a tease for something later, which is this little purple piece is just a, a bit of 3D printer uh, brim that I had pulled off of a part that I'll show you later. So I wanted something lightweight to attach to that. So I used this little piece of purple circle. Uh, so that is the, uh, the product of the week. Here's another sh little shot of it you can see there. That's the Cricut for Microbit. Um, and here, I'll turn this one off and then unplug it. And you can see it's that easy, which is really cool. It's a little edge, edge connector, just like an old PC card. That's it. It plugs in and uh, makes connections with all those little teeth on there. Whoop. So that's uh, product of the week. This thing is super cool. And if you haven't checked out uh, the micro bit, it's a neat uh, board. It's a kind of a cool complement to Circuit Playground Express. It has some overlap and some differences. Um, I'm not sure about programming it beyond make code. Someone tell me in the chat because I can't remember. How else can you program it? I think you can use Java on it. Probably JavaScript. Yeah, you can use JavaScript because of the make code connection, but I'm not sure if there's another editor where you can go in and do something like Circuit Python on there. Um, so someone tell me, because I just don't have a lot of experience with the micro bit. Um, all right, but uh, I'm going to take a, a sip of delicious, delicious coffee. Mm. Yeah, someone uh, asked about the shirt. This is uh, my Atari 2600 joystick shirt by Coop, the artist Coop. Super awesome artist, super awesome joystick equals super awesome shirt. Uh, the Moo editor. Yeah, someone just mentioned you can use the Moo editor to program uh, the, is it MicroPython? Okay, a MicroPython in the Moo editor. That's what you want to do if you want to program the uh, little micro bits with other methods. But I highly recommend the silicone cat case because, man, that's cute. Um, don't go plug in lipos into this either. I checked online before I did because I thought I remembered you can't. I think you need a voltage regulator to do that. So this, this is uh, about 3 volts. And I don't know that it'll like the 3.7 off of a lipo. Anyway, I'll stop talking about the micro bit that I know very little about other than that it's super cool. So check it out. Uh, all right. Let's see. You know what time it is. I think it's time for Night Code Minute. All right, so let me pull up. There's my make code session, all big. And I'm also going to bring in a Circuit Playground Express. There it is. That's Circuit Playground Express. And I've got a 
set of alligator clips and a knob on there because for today's Make Code Minute, we're going to look at reading a potentiometer on the Circuit Playground Express using Make Code. And this is a really easy one. Look at how few blocks I've got on here. And this one is almost unnecessary. I've got a block here with an on start loop that's just setting the brightness of my NeoPixels just because I didn't want them super, super bright. And then the guts of the code, here's what matters. In this forever loop, I have a variable that I've created called pot value. And this is just to make things easy to read. You could even get away without using this. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm setting the pot value variable to the analog read on pin A1. And that's the key thing here in reading sensors uh, is that on pin A1, this pad right here of my Circuit Playground Express, I have the middle uh, wiper connection to a potentiometer plugged in, and then I've got ground and power. So that means that my little potentiometer is acting as a voltage divider. And then what I'm doing is using this really simple graph node that comes out of the light category, and I'm graphing whatever that value is that I'm reading from the potentiometer on A1 to a value of 0 to 1023. Uh, so what this does is, if you look here, as I go down to 0 volts, it graphs that to 0 neopixels. And then as I dial this up, it is at about 1023 now, and so it has lit up all the NeoPixels. And graph is kind of this cool function that uh, does a bunch of neat things for you. It's not only remapping those 1023 or 1024 values from zero to nine, but it's also uh, putting some colors to them. So it's a little hard to see on my monitor here, but we go from about uh, a blue through the color wheel up to red. Uh, and so you can use this for all kinds of things, not just lighting up lights, you can use it for music things, for controlling other uh, things that are plugged into the Circuit Playground Express, like servos and motors. Um, but I think it's a very valuable thing to know how to graph and read potentiometers on the Circuit Playground Express using Make Code. And that is our Make Code Minute. All right, well, let's get that little guy out of there. Goodbye, little guy. Uh, actually, let me put him up real big because that's kind of fun to look at. Let's see a little better. I don't know where I got this potentiometer. It has an enormously long shaft on it and I put a little knob on the end so it's kind of silly looking. But it's just fun, right? Turning knobs and seeing things happen. And look how fast that is. It's very responsive. Lots and lots of fun. Uh, that's how I amuse myself. How about you? What's going on in the chat? CPX is huge. <laughs> Where do we get that one? It's bigger than an Ultimaker, it's true. Yeah, is that crazy that you can green screen stuff in real time on this uh, video broadcast software? It's, uh, it's very convenient. Uh, so I'm green screening two things when I usually show that. I'm green screening the make code session in a browser and I'm green screening the, uh, the background. I just have this silicone green mat here. Uh, all right, well, let's see. What's next? I think it's time to talk about uh, stop motion animation because that's the subject. You can see it's written right there. It says today we're talking about stop motion animation. Um, so let me show an example. Here's a, here's a little example. You may have seen it. I just posted this one online. Here's a little cute little example. All right. So here you can see, I'm going to talk over it while it plays again. Here's our little cricket friend, and he's going to go trick-or-treating as a sort of Batman. And look, the real Batman, Adabot actually, comes into the frame flying in and uh, blows the mind of our little Adafruit cricket who falls over. Not dead, just uh, maybe catatonic for a little while. So uh, everyone's seen stop motion. I'm sure you're familiar with stop motion, but it's worth, I think, looking at some of the things that you can do to improve, the, well, first of all, get started with it. Um, and do so in a way that's easy for you. Um, because stop motion animation, like any kind of animation, is simply a illusion based on persistence of vision, where if you take a series of still frames and play them back rapidly, we, in our minds, fill in the blank and see motion. And this is how film works, this is how video works, everything is just still frames stitched together. 
Um, so in stop motion animation, you're usually using puppets or objects or uh, sometimes materials like clay, and you're posing things, shooting a frame or more frames, I'll talk about that in a second, uh, an image, a photograph, <clears throat> and then proceeding forward. So changing the pose, shooting frames, changing the pose, shooting frames. Uh, so you can do this with any camera. You could do this with any smartphone, any tablet, a webcam, uh, just using straight up photo apps. Um, but that really requires either a lot of luck or a lot of planning uh, and you don't have a lot of opportunity to, <clears throat> excuse me, fine tune your work. So what I'm going to recommend is get an app that's designed expressly for stop motion animation uh, because it's going to give you a few key things. One, it's going to allow you to um, use the manual controls on your camera. So if you look at, I'm just going to play some other ones. Let's see if you can, let's see, this one... Okay, notice how the lighting is changing throughout this. So here's one I did with this little posing puppet. Um, so you'll see that the background, that black foam core back there, is kind of pulsing and dancing around just because my camera was in automatic mode. So it was readjusting its exposure level on a lot of these frames just based on what I was doing with the figure in the front. It was, it was adjusting exposures, which is not a good look. So uh, switching over, I think this one I did... <clears throat> okay, so this one I've got manual controls on the camera's exposure, white balance, and everything. So you'll notice that it's pretty stable. Um, there's stuff going on in the background there. It's like a computer screensaver going on that I cropped out later. Um, but you can see just the difference between not um, using manual controls on your camera, where we get these dancing lights going on, versus here, where I've locked down those settings. Uh, let's see, here's another one I did. It. Okay, yeah, there's, there's something else I want to talk about with that one, so we'll skip that one for a second. Okay, so um, you'll notice, looking at this example again, I've got very nice even lighting. Uh, focus is locked essentially on the background there. Um, our characters could come out of focus if they came too far forward, but I've essentially locked everything down in the camera, so that's one. Uh, a second thing is lock down your camera, right? A, a camera moving around while you're doing stop motion will not look good. Um, the third thing is onion skinning. So I'm going to show you a real demo of this in a second, but essentially onion skinning is uh, a version of tracing paper, except it's on the, pad, on the iPad or the phone or the, the computer you're using. And so the idea is you want to see one or more previous frames that you took of your subject while you're posing the next one. So if, for example, we're doing a stop motion animation of, uh, here, we'll grab this figure. Okay, so if we're doing a stop motion animation of this figure, if I have him posed right here and I, and I shoot one frame, and then on the next frame he's going to start to swing back because he's going to punch someone. So that's the motion he's going to do. As he swings back, if I move him and nudge him a little bit, he might lose his contact with the ground and look like he's slipping and sliding around. And with a figure like this, you may even want to pick it up, pose it, and then set it back down. So what onion skinning does is it gives you essentially a transparent or semi-transparent uh, version of the previous frame to align to. If you show more layers of onion skinning going back, let's say, three frames, it might help you see the arc of motion or the separation between spacing of frames, which gives you an indication of how fast things are moving. Um, so these are traditional animation techniques. If you look at any book on uh, like the Animator Survival Kit uh, or Preston Blair's book on animation. Those are 2D hand-drawn animation books, but all the timing things apply. So in spacing your character to move, you want to be able to see where it was. So onion skinning is one thing. Ooh, tell me if... Tell me if the video starts to stutter, because I'm noticing my machine is, is yelling at me. It's giving me some, some red blinking. How is the... Let's see, do I have the... Give me one second. I want to pop up a video stream. How's that look? Is it still moving? Are we still alive? Yeah, it looks like we are. Okay. Uh, yeah, tell me in the chats if, if we have any problems because I'm seeing my, for some reason, my computer. Oh, it looks like it's not broadcasting. Hmm.
Oh no. All right, you tell me. Buff All right, I just restarted the stream. And the only concern I have is, will that pick back up on Facebook? It looks like it is. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. That's weird. Audio's good, but not the video, huh? Again, buffering. All right. Yeah, you lost me when I talked about onion skinning. Okay. I'm going to hope, because I'm seeing a green uh, light here, that we're broadcasting okay now. Looks good now, huh? Okay, good. So, so uh, backing up a second, talking about onion skinning, and let's just do a demo. In fact, let's switch over here while it seems like the stream is uh, working. I'm going to go to the workshop camera, and I'm going to open up. All right, so let's switch over here. And uh, good, we're all good now, okay. So, I was talking about onion skinning, and what onion skinning does is it gives you the ability to see where things were on a previous frame. In fact, you can see it right now, do you see Boba Fett right there on my screen? He's not actually in front of the camera right now, he's here in my hand. So if we were in the middle of making him, let's say he's falling, now I can line him up, and you'll see his head got turned, so I'm gonna fix his head. Uh, Legos are a great thing to use for stop motion, by the way. So uh, that example I was playing with some stickers, and uh, here's some Legos. But you can see now, if I'm shooting a frame of animation, uh, see that onion skin moving? That tells me where I came from. And then if I'm adding a frame of animation, I know where to put it. Um, so let's, let's play this one through. You can see what's happening here, and then we can add something to it. Uh, so here you can see I've got Boba Fett flying into frame. I've got this other guy who seems to not notice at all. So Boba Fett flies away, and then dude looks where Boba Fett was. And hmm. All right, so let's add on to this, how about? Um, what do we want to do? Let's have, uh, let's have this little guy walk on. So I've got this little deep sea diver. Let's take his spear out of his hand just because that might be a little too much. Uh, you'll notice here something else I'm doing is that I'm shooting it down. So since I wanted characters to fly uh, without using a rig that I would have to remove optically later or digitally later, uh, if you don't need characters moving towards the camera, um, and I'll show you a trick for that in a second, then this is a nice way to deal with uh, fighting gravity. Um, so here I can see where my character was. I'm, another trick is I'm using the shutter release that's found on a pair of earbuds. I just trimmed off the rest of the earbuds. Uh, they were broken anyway. Uh, so the little button on these often takes photos for you. So I'm going to shoot a frame uh, or two, and then I'm going to bring this guy in. Uh, how about this guy floats up from the bottom inexplicably? So you might see right here, I can see the top of his head. And it might be funny to bob that up and down a little bit. So what I'm doing is I just shot two frames with it up, then bring it down and shoot two frames, and up two frames, and down two frames, and then a little higher up. Let's go three frames so we can register that. And now as I'm doing this, let's scrub just to see, how's that looking? Uh, Let's play it. Let's skip ahead. Oh, you can see my lighting changed. Okay, this is, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with, or we'll leave that alone. It's gonna look weird. It's gonna shift to later that night. <laughs> and so now we see our little guy bobbing around, right? I think I had these lights on before. Um, so this is another tip is you want consistent lighting. So don't rely on ambient light. I'll turn these off now just cause we've already got it without them. Um, but you may wanna, take your time shooting your animation, and even just the sun subtly moving across the sky as you're, as you're working can um, really impact things. So let's see, where are we? We've got him down here. He bobbed up once. I'm gonna 
have him come up. I also want to move his head in there. So I'm going to take off his mask. I'm going to turn his head. And you can see you'd never have a prayer of putting him back in the same spot if it weren't for the onion skinning. So now I'm going to leave him mostly alone uh, position-wise, but now I've got the head rotating in there. And I'm going to have him look kind of quickly, so I'm doing just one frame per head turn. So that's enough for us to register that he's seeing the guy. And now how about um, he's going to anticipate by moving down kind of quickly. So I'm pulling him out of frame, out of frame, out of frame, and then I'm going to pop him up quite high. Up. He's going to fly up into the air. We're going to move him a little less, hold him at the top, bring him down. Watch out getting your finger in these shots. And he'll fall to the ground. Somehow, no one understands why, but there's the ground and a little bounce. Okay, so we'll play that. So here comes Boba. Now you'll notice Boba flies towards the camera. It's not too obvious. I'm going to uh, show you a way that you can do that sort of thing. Okay, here's our guy bobbing. How's he looking? Bink, and he's landed. Oh, I saw my finger in that last frame there. Um, so that is uh, a very basic, and you can see using Legos or stickers like I did, you don't have to worry too much about posing. You can move their little arms and their little legs and their heads a bit, um, but that's a, you know, a far cry from the amount of things you have to keep straight if you use an action figure, or this is this thing called Sticky Bones that's a kind of an artist's posing dummy and uh, animator's posing dummy that's also pretty good for uh, stop motion animation because it holds its poses well, but it's got a lot of degrees of freedom and range of motion. Uh, this guy also has magnets on his feet and hands, which is very useful. The toe has magnets, the heel has magnets, palms have magnets, so you can, you can use that to hold poses that would be otherwise difficult. Um, but you can see, when you're getting started, you want to get, uh, I'm using Stop Motion Studio, which is free and it's available on Windows, iOS, Android, uh, and uh, Macintosh. Uh, it's great. There's a pro version. I haven't found a need for any of the pro features for what I'm doing. Um, this works really well. It's got the onion skinning. You can even adjust the uh, amount of onion skinning in here. You can rearrange frames, copy and paste frames. So it's, uh, it's what you need. Now... I talked about uh, frames, so if you, uh, if you notice, I've got 90 frames here, uh, but this goes on a lot longer than what's uh, 90 divided by 24. That would be less than two seconds. Uh, and the reason is I've gone into the settings and I've said, for every frame I shoot, I want you to hold it uh, for six frames. So it's, it's shooting at essentially five frames per second, but it plays back at 24 frames a second. Uh, in animation, the smoothest animation is called shot on ones. So every frame of the animation has a different pose and you get very smooth motion. Shooting on twos means that you hold every frame for two frames within a second, which is 24 frames a second. Uh, and a lot of uh, Saturday morning cartoons and anime is shot on threes. Here we're shooting on sixes, and that gets us through it a lot more quickly, and it's a great way to start. You don't want to be frustrated with only doing very small motions at first. So um, even with the, the animations I showed you with this guy, um, he's shot on sixes, I think it is. So here's an animation. Uh, I said I wanted to show you a little trick. So here we have, uh, oh, that's a neat idea. Someone in the chat said having the same model in different sizes to be pseudo knee to make it look like they're um, So this one, I, you'll see there's poses here that wouldn't hold, uh, can't hold his legs out without kind of flopping forward. And so the trick here is that I'm using a fly rig. Um, so this is a rig that he's basically plugged into at the back of his hips. And then I removed that later in post-production. So that's a much more advanced technique. But even some of these stop-motion uh, apps on the uh, iPad allow for green screening. So you may be able to green screen, essentially put a green background and a green rig like this. Uh, or you can use string. And there's a lot of ways that you can hide the fact that you're holding things up. Um, but I went in and just removed that with some matting and some green screen techniques. And you may be able to see this in the screen light back there. It's just sort of spill light 
bouncing off of the rig and onto the mountain. Um, so that is a way that you can do much more sophisticated things. Um, if you notice, looking back at this one, I just hid the fact that he was coming off screen using, I had some helping hands, so um, let's go to add this. I was using one of these little beauties, which a lot of you may have in your workshops for uh, positioning things, a little coolant tube, but it's used as a helping hand. So I just had my character attached here. Oh no, is YouTube buffering again? It is. All right, uh, I hope that that stream picks back up for you. I have just re restarted it. Um, sorry about that. Uh, you lost Twitch as well, huh? I'm hoping those come back on. Yeah, it seems like they come back on without spawning a new uh, instance of the video. That's good. Um, okay, well, I hope you didn't miss the bit about uh, using a fly rig. Is this familiar? Did you all see that? I showed a fly rig for him, and then for this animation, I was using just a nice helping hand uh, that's off screen. So let me go to full screen of that. Cut out in the middle of that. Yeah, so, oops, let me turn him around. So I was just using one of these. Uh, it's got a magnetic base, so I had it stuck down so this thing wasn't moving. And then Batman, uh, Adabot Bat bot was coming uh, off screen and I just wasn't showing this bit of it. Um, when I took off, um, yeah, and there's also camera tricks you can use to hide this kind of stuff. So if the camera is straight on and your rig is essentially right behind it, uh, let's say magnet stuck to a wall, then you can do that sort of thing. Um, when I had Adabot take off, another trick you can use is to build up Legos underneath it or other objects. So here's a stack of Legos. If you start with one and shoot a frame and then add another one and another one and another one, uh, like so, you can see that it'll, it'll build up in height and brrr, find its way out. In fact, I think if you watch the Lego movie, they do that in some cases where uh, even though that was all computer graphics, you don't need to stick Legos underneath anything. They did show some cute things sometimes where little uh, like round stud bricks were underneath things as they were lifting up. Um, I forget in what scenes they did that, but uh, that's you know part of the charm of it, especially with Lego, um, what do they call it, brick films. That's something to look up if you're interested in this sort of stuff. Um, but there are uh, a lot of techniques you can use to deal with the fact that there's gravity. Another is to shoot some things this way where, you know, I can fly really well because I'm shooting straight down. And then for shots where I want characters walking towards and away the camera, we could reorient the camera and the backdrop and the, the ground. If you use foam core or cardboard, no one, no one can tell. Um, so those are uh, a couple of techniques that are useful for this. Uh, and I'm putting out a guide with some of these uh, principles and some of these basic ideas to get you started. And then if you're interested, there are so many resources online. There are great books about it. If you look at some of the books that Ardman has put out on some of, the, uh, some of their techniques, as well as more in-depth guides, uh, I think from Focal Press, they've put in some, some good books about uh, building armatures and puppets and rigs and things like that. Uh, hello, Andris Yefimovs from Germany, who just joined us in the YouTube chat. Welcome. Uh, we are just wrapping up, so uh, you may want to wait for this to get saved, and then you can go back and watch it. Um, Jason Bogovich says it would be cool if deep learning AI could write between frames for you. That's really interesting, doing, doing uh, in-between frames. And, you know, in computer graphics, there's much more automated in-betweening. Typically, you'll pose a character on extreme keys and then do maybe a breakdown in between, and then some of the intermediate poses you'll... Uh, use animation function curves to, to let it do some of the work for you. Although, I will tell you, when I worked at Disney, animators there did tend to have keys on every frame. They didn't really want the computer uh, uh, telling them what to do, so usually it was still, by the end of things, there were keys on nearly every frame. Um, so, 
I think that is all we have for today. Before we go, a couple, a couple of things I wanted to mention again. There's our coupon code, so 10% off in the Adafruit store today with the coupon code Harryhausen. Uh, and that is good on anything you get in the store other than software, gift certificates, and subscriptions. Speaking of subscriptions, tune in next Wednesday, 1010, October 10th, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're saying to yourself, wait a second, isn't that when Ask an Engineer happens? And the answer is yes, except this Wednesday is going to be a very special Ask an Engineer Ada Box 9 Unboxing Edition. So I'll be there to unbox the Ada Box if you've gotten yours or are getting yours in the mail before then. Fantastic. You can play along. Uh, Lady Ada and Mr. Lady Ada will be in the chat, and I hope to see you there. Uh, and that is... Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Certainly. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, stopping by in the Discord chat, people, in the YouTube chat for... Uh, talking about the stuff you enjoyed from today, and let me know if there's other stuff you're interested in. Uh, someone asked at the beginning of the show, might have been Jason, if we were going to do something more advanced like a camera rig for stop motion. I would love to do that. I think that could be a really fun uh, topic to explore. If you're interested, and I'll mention this in my guide, look at Dragon Frame. It is the uh, software of choice for professionals doing animation, and it has hooks into motion control cameras, uh, slider rigs, gimbal rigs, and they've even got support for Arduino. So you can write your own um, or, or build your own rigs that could move set pieces, move characters, fly characters, vehicles. More commonly, if you're trying to do tracking shots and pushing shots, you have those uh, pre-established and the software is pushing your camera along for you. It'd be really fun to build some of that stuff. They also have really cool button boxes for controlling the software that are uh, either Bluetooth or wired. So... Lots and lots of cool stuff. Ask an animator. That's right. Today, today Noe is the special Ask an Animator edition of John Park's Workshop. Uh, so I better stop there, and I can't wait to see you next Wednesday. Thank you, everyone, for stopping by John Park's Workshop. See ya.